na wahum la yuftanun wa laqad qatanna alladhina min qablihim fala ya'lamanna allahu alladhina sadaqu wa la ya'lamanna alkadhibin salawat ala muhammad wa ala alihi allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad Four hundred and thirty-one years have yeah. passed since the Prophet migrated to Medina uh. and began the opening or went through the opening the victory that Allah gave him and established a islamic state in medina and it only took 61 years for the muslim ummah who received these blessings ya Allah. and these favors from Allah by medium of His Messenger. Mm. It only took them 61 years for them to annihilate His family ya Allah. and to kill His grandson. Mm. How does a favor like that and a bounty like that and this height that Allah had given to the people and to the Muslims in particular he gave them his deen he, he gave them his miraculous book mm-hmm. He gave them a just law and He gave them a merciful ruler. Who could have asked for a better ruler than the Prophet of Allah? Who could have asked for a better law than the law of Allah? Who could have asked for a better book than the book of Allah? And who could have asked for the blessings and the uh, favors that came through the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet? I mean, you couldn't have asked for anything better in this world. Then the question now is how is it that the situation became so bad in 61 years that <laughs> the same people that these blessings were given to see it's not outsiders it's not people who don't believe it's the same people who were given all these blessings all these favors right What happened? That the situation and the environment became so bad that the uh, grandchildren of the Prophet, the same bloodline of the Prophet, the bloodline that Allah has declared in the Quran as being free of impurity. A bloodline that is free of impurity, people who are free from impurity, people who have been purified by Allah. Why is it that their blood was shed and how did this nation reach that stage? On one hand. And then, with the same regard, with every revival, obviously, the people thought that they are going to put out the flame of Allah but Allah has different plans 
Haan. They annihilated. They thought that they annihilated the bloodline of the Prophet, but mm. Allah had a different plan that He again revived the same spirit of Islam through the death of the Prophet's grandson. Mm. Revived that. And every, you see so often, Allah revives it. And Allah gives the example and starts something that you see that again. The hearts of believers change and they return to Allah. They return to Allah. But every time you see that a new movement starts, that a new beginning occurs, that a new revival takes place, and a new uh, light is seen, you see again that there are some things that occur that again starts to break down those very things that uh, this new beginning has given. The new faith, the energy, the light, the knowledge. Whenever it's revived, you see that something have some things happen. And people again get back and are destroyed by these things. <coughs> now, what these things are called is fitna. Well, these things are called is fitna. Fitna is that, and these fitna is that, that you see that any time a new light is seen, and any time something good happens, you see uh, fitna attaches itself to the truth, to this light, and works to destroy this light from within. Allah, you see this, and I want you to understand this. Allah said that those people who do not believe, they cannot do anything to Allah's deen and Allah's book and Allah's life. Allah is a protector. Right? But then you see, what hurts and harms the movement is the fitna that comes from within. <laughs> the fitna that comes from within. And now, for us, we need to see that it has been mentioned that in our age that we are waiting for the reappearance and the reemergence of the last light of Allah that is going to again make this whole world illuminated. The realistically, he is going to he is going to illuminate the world, the one who's awaited, the last Imam. He is going to illuminate the world, right? He is not the he is not the illuminated. He is going to illuminate the world, right? He is going to illuminate the world, and hence, what we have been so much in hadith and so much in the sayings of the infallibles what we have been told and we have been uh, informed about all through these times is the fact that the thing that we need to be concerned about is the fitna that is going to cause believers that is going to prevent them from coming to the side of this imam yes mm. You see that every imam and every infallible has warned us of the fitna. Of this fitna that is going to come and is going this trial. This, And I'll explain what fitna is as we go on because the subject of these 10 days will be fitna. And what we want to know in these 10 days very well that where does fitna come from? How does it happen? How do we fight it and how are we successful in going forward from this fitna? Wow. And Allah has, and we see the Imams have mentioned that when the Imam will come, what will prevent believers from joining the Imam is the fitna that's going to take place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. 
And really, if you look at the time that we're living in, it is amazing how the words of Hadith, when it's not from one Imam, all the 12 Imams have mentioned that the uh, center of fitna will be the area what we call the Middle East. The center of fitna is what we call the, the Sham, you know, the, the, the Sham, which is this whole area of uh, uh, Palestine, Jordan, Sham, and Israel, and all that whole area. They said that that will be the center of it. Now, not one Imam, all 12 Imams have mentioned that. Mm-hmm. All 12 Imams have mentioned that, that. That is going to be the time when the Imam will come back, that will be the center of it. Now, so hence, based on these hadiths from all the 12 Imams, we can conclude this fact that uh, the fitna is apparent in the Middle East, and two, that the reappearance of the Imam is very near. Mm. Mm. It's very close. And hence, uh, one thing that is going to prevent believers from um, going to the Imam is that they will not be able to get out of this fitna, and they will be entrapped in it. That's one thing. And on a larger picture, we see that. Uh, the result of faith and action, the outcome of Islam and Iman is Jannah, is heaven, is paradise. And to us it has been mentioned that fitna is like chains in the hands and feet of a believer. Fitna is like chains in the hands and feet of a believer that tie him up and prevent him from reaching Jannah. The way believers, those who believe, and we are talking about believers, not those who don't believe. Not believers. Believers, they, if they don't reach Jannah, it's because they cannot deal with fitna. They cannot deal with fitna. And when they cannot deal with fitna, that's why they cannot reach Jannah. They cannot reach heaven. Right? They don't. It's hard for them to reach heaven. And this is the reason why you see that we have to now, this is an important subject that we need to discuss and know exactly how and where this comes from. And Allah has mentioned it abundantly in the Quran and we have so many hadiths regarding it. So that we can be taught how to deal with this and what is this and how it happens and how we can pass the test mm. and for today I'm just going to go to this ayat that I read for you and we have heard this before many times because this is one of those ayats in one of those chapters that is recited on the night of Qadr one of the uh, recommended chapters to be decided in the night of Qadr is this chapter. And just that it is recommended to be decided in the night of Qadr shows its importance of how Allah wants everyone to know this. Okay. You see, Allah in some things has made, has made things attractive. Right? In all the ibadat you see, in all the worship that you see, you know, there is the attachment of worship is Jannah. Meaning if you pray, you go to Jannah. If you fast, heaven, if you do this, heaven, I mean the end result of worship, the end result of um, Islam and Iman is Jannah. Right? And hence, obviously, that is the incentive also for many a believer that the incentive is Jannah. Right? That they want to go to Jannah. They want to go to paradise and heaven. But there are certain things that Allah attached to some of the worship that also makes it attractive for people. Not only Jannah, but something else is attached in order to bring them closer to it. And one of those things that Allah attached something else other than Jannah to is Laylatul Qadr. You see, the reason why 
people not people you see and not just people you know we can look at one example how many nights do we wake up and pray how many nights do we actually wake up and read the Quran how many nights do we wake up and worship to Allah right and if we don't worship on any night at least we will worship on Laylatul Qadr right you see that everyone comes on Laylatul Qadr and they will all worship Allah on the night of Qadr and here you see the reason for many is the fact that Allah did not only attach Jannah behind Laylatul Qadr, but He also attached something else. And He said that your risk of the year is going to be decided on Laylatul Qadr. Because your risk is going to be decided on Laylatul Qadr, you see the rush. Mm. The amount of people that come. If Allah had said that you're going to get Jannah out of this, they'll say, well, we get Jannah out of everything. Mm. Right? It's not something big. But because dunya is attached to this, because something we're going to get in dunya, so now you see the rush in Laylatul al Qadr. And Allah attached this for a reason. Allah attached this for a reason. He wanted, He wanted that in Laylatul al Qadr, that when people are attracted by this, then they listen to the message that is going to be given on Laylatul Qadr. Mm. And one of those chapters that is being read on Laylatul Qadr is Surah Al Kabut, the spider. Right? And when that chapter is being read, the first ayat of this chapter, when it starts, it says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Alif Lam Mim. The first ayat, the first verse of Surah al kabud is saying, and I'll go through this, <coughs> saying Alif Lam Mim. Alif Lam Mim is the same letters as the one that is used in the second chapter of the Quran, Surah Baqarah, after al -Hand. There Allah says, Alif la meem, dalikal kitabu la raibati. Over there he's saying that there is no doubt in this book. And here, when Allah speaks about Alif la meem, when Allah he speaks about Alif la meem, what is he saying? That does man think that he's going to be left alone saying, I believe. He's going to be left on saying, I believe, and that he will not be tested, that he will not face fitna. In other words, the first place you use Alif Lam Mim, right? The first place you use Alif Lam Mim is where? In Surah Baqarah. The second place you use Alif Lam Mim is in Surah Al Kabut. There he speaks and says that there is no doubt in the Qur'an and here he says that he has doubt in believers. Mm. There he says that there is no doubt in the book of Allah and there is complete certainty in the book of Allah. And here he says that there is doubt in believers in their faith. Here he speaks about doubt now. And what is that doubt? He says, Ahaseb al Nas. My friends, listen carefully to this verse. The way he speaks, Haseba, means that, you know, the way it is said that, I mean, do they really think it's in that form? Do you really think? Do you really think that you can say, I believe? And you'll be left alone. Huh? I mean, you think that you can say that and get away with it? This is how it's said. I mean, this is. I mean, when you read the uh, translation, you don't get the tone and the meaning out of that. But the tone of reading it is like, do you really think? Do you really think that you can get away with saying I believe? Yeah? Uh, that, yes, I believe. Oh, okay, good, good. You know? Now, he says, 
If you say you believe, then you will face fitna. You will face fitna. You will face fitna. You will face trial. You will face a trial. You will face it. There's no doubt about it. In that, he wants us to know that if we say I believe, then know that there is a trial for you. That Allah is giving that trial. Right? That Allah is giving you this trial. Not others. And I'll explain the difference between Allah's trial and others' trial. In some place else he says, do you think that the trial of people is like my trial? Mm-hmm. And he wants us to think, do you think that what the people can do to you is the same that what I can do to you? Mm-hmm. What do you think? I mean, you're equating me with the people? No. They act with their ignorance, they don't even know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You see, my friends, what happens, a lot of times you'll see that. You know, you get angry at someone, someone did something to you and you get angry at him. You get angry at him and now you're a believer. So now what happened is that you want to take revenge. You want to do something in revenge of that. So now when you say something to them in revenge and you want to say something to them. Now, here you have two options. Either you can do something wrong to them. Or either you can leave them to Allah to handle. You can leave them for Allah that He handles them. So now when you see these two options that you have, when you do something to Him, then what happens is that you can only harm Him to the extent that you have the power. But if you leave Him in Allah's hand, then you see that when Allah deals with him, then he deals with him in such a way that you cannot have the reach to deal with it. So now when we think that Allah's deeds are the same as ours, then we say, I don't care what Allah do, I will do it myself. You see, when we equate his actions to ours, then we don't have faith that, listen, I don't think Allah can give me justice. I will take justice myself. So understand this. This is, this is a reaction. And hence when we see how uh, Allah is mentioning here that I am the one who gives you these trials. I am the one who tries you and examines you and pushes you to this fitna. And then he says, and don't think that you are new to this. Don't think you are new. He says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ We have tried those who are before you. We have tried those who said we believe before you. So this is happening to everyone. You're not new, you're not the only one. So don't complain that, you know what, why me? No. It's you because you said you believe. If you didn't believe, then you won't face my fitna, you will face the fitna of the people. You won't face you will face the fitna of the people. Right? But if you believe, then whatever fitna you get, it is from me, and I am the one who tests you now. Right? Now why he tests you, we'll inshallah discuss that later. But just here you need to understand that these tests happen. And the higher you go in your faith, the test will increase. The test will increase. My friends, from here understand. I'm just giving an introduction today. And I want you to know what I'm speaking of in the next 10 days so that uh, we will have a good understanding of where it's going. When you go higher in faith, your test becomes harder and harder. But the question is, it must end sometime. I mean, really, how much do you have to test someone to know that he's a good believer? Or to know that his faith is really good? He tested, for example, when you look at it, the greatest amongst all believers is the prophet. Mm. And he's testing him. He's testing him. You know, he's also going through tests. He's also going through those trials and that fitna. 
He's also going through that. But you see, my friend, here is something that happened. That if you, if, why are you testing them? Allah mentions that. وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا To know who is truthful in their claim and who is lying in their claim. So the reason for him testing is to see who's truthful and who's lying. And the higher your Iman goes, he tests. And then he's giving a test to the Prophet also and to the Imams also. So Allah, if you are still testing them to see their faith, why did you make them a Prophet? Why did you make him a messenger? When you have doubts about his faith and you want to see how much faith he has, why did you make him a prophet? Why did you make him an imam? You see, if it was for higher levels, uh, what more higher can you get than the seal of the prophet? How much more higher can you get than going on Miraj and being so close to Allah that He says it was like two fingers that are together. <laughs> there is nothing higher you can get. There's no space up there to go higher. You know, there's no room to go any higher. And you keep on testing the Prophet for what? You keep on testing the Imam for what? My friend, sometimes you see when the test gets harder and your faith becomes higher, you'll see that a time comes when the test stops being for you. When the test stops being for you, but the test through you is for the people around you. My friends, understand this. You know how I'm doing this, you know, and I want you to know this, what it means. <coughs> the Messenger of Allah, you know, when he established the state, you know, the, uh, you can say the uh, spurts of fitna started right away. But it climaxed when he died. It came to a climax when he died, you know, the, all that fitna that was really brewing up. And you see that here, when you look at the position of Imam Ali, Ali Muhammad. You see, when you look at his position, you see that Imam Ali, in his own self and in his own responsibility, as a reaction to what is happening, my obviously was isolated, stepped away, kept silent. Now, the people knew the right of Ali, and they were afraid of Imam Ali. They had that fear of Imam Ali because they knew that he was the rightful ruler, he was the rightful leader, that he should be the one leading the Muslims, <coughs> that this was Allah's decree and the uh, declaration of the Prophet. They knew that. And this was to such an extent that they did not even use to take his name. <laughs> they didn't take his name, Ali. Instead, they used to call him Wasi. They used to call him Wasi, the successor. They used to call him the successor. Everyone you say, the successor had said. Well, the successor is not here. They knew that he's the successor. If you look in the early Islam, and if you look at the time of the early Islam, you will see that he was uh, that. His name was not mentioned. He was not mentioned as Ali. He was mentioned as Wasi by people. And this, you see, how important it is that they knew that he's a successor. Right? They knew that he's a successor. So now, when he was a successor and they knew that, he kept silent. And in that silence, uh, Ibn Abbas. Uh, Abbas came to him 
But Abbas came to him. Is that cool? And said that, why don't you declare, you know, I will make bayat to you. I know you are right. I'll make bayat to you. I'll make allegiance to you. Right? I will make allegiance to you. He said, Imam Ali said, do you think that the people will make allegiance? He said, yes, why not? The people will also make allegiance to you. They will also make bay'at to you. Imam Ali said, but what about this verse of the Quran that Allah said? This saying of the Quran that Allah says, that Ahasibana Do you think that the people will be left alone saying, I believe? And will not be tested. What about this verse? If I give my hands for bayat to them, then where will this verse apply? Where will this verse apply if I also go forward? When the other person is saying, give bayat to me, and I'm saying, here, give bayat to me also. Half of you make bayat to him, half of you make bayat to me. If both of us are making bayat, then this ayat will not have any place to apply. It will not have any place to apply. I am holding back my hand. So that this verse can apply. So that you understand that the test when the whole world turned against Ali after the death of the Prophet, ya Allah. when he was isolated and he ya went Allah. into silence and isolation, this wasn't a test for Ali. This was a test for the Ummah. Why aren't you saying something about this? was the test on the people. The people are being tested. You see your leader is silent. Why aren't you saying something? Why aren't you doing something? You see that his right has been taken. Why aren't you doing something? Why are you sitting back and saying, well if he sits, I'll sit also inside. I won't do anything. Well, he's not sitting because oh, he wants to sit. He's sitting because he has no choice. Mm. You have to see that situation that he has no choice. And you have to go forward and give your hand on his hand. <laughs> you need to give your hand on his hand. So you see, Ali's silence was not a test on him, was not a fitna for him. It was a fitna for the people. It was a trial for the people. And my friends, the same way Ali, Ali was silent then. Mm. Ali is silent today. Mm. Uh -huh. I speak for him. The same way Ali is silent then. He is still silent. Yeah. He is still silent. He is still not saying anything. Mm. He is still in ghaibat. He is still in occultation. And his occultation is not a fitna for him. It is a fitna on us. It is a fitna for us. It is a test for us and trial for us. What are we doing? What are we doing in this fitna? What are we doing about his labor? What are we doing about his occultation? And him not being here. My friends, this... Really, is the first of Muharram, and the first of Muharram is the day that we renew our allegiance to the Imam. We renew our allegiance to the Imam. If you understand this, you know how do you do that? How do you do that? You know how do you do that? You see. You don't find the hand of the Imam right now to give allegiance to. You know, when you want to give allegiance, when you give bayat, you look for the Imam and you ask for his hand and you give bayat. You know, because the hand of the Imam is not here, we are in mourning. Because we cannot put our hand on the hand of the Imam, we are in mourning. 
We're in mourning. And the symbol of mourning, my friends, understand the symbol of the mourning of Imam Hussain. The symbol of mourning is what you see is the hand. You see the hand there, that is a symbol of mourning. The hand is standing, why? Because the real hand of the Imam is not here. The real, if the real hand was here, we would not need this. We would give our hand to the hand of the Imam. <laughs> But because we do not have the hand to give bayat and allegiance to the Imam, that's why we have the symbol of his hand, so that we know that we give bayat to the hand. Mm. This, my friends, is, a, uh, is renewing our allegiance. Because we give bayat to those hands that were cut in Allah's hand. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Those hands that were cut in Allah's way, we give allegiance to both hands. <laughs> you know the reason the hand stands up? I want you to understand this. You know, there's one thing that we give bayat to the truth. Allegiance for the truth. We give allegiance for the truth, you know? Allegiance for the truth is when you give your hand in the hand of the rightful Imam. Mm. But I will say one thing just randomly so that you understand something. <laughs> Rejecting the battle and not giving your hands in the hands of battle is also allegiance to the truth. Mm. <laughs> when you don't give your hand in the hand of battle, and falsehood, and do not give your hand in allegiance to them, that is also allegiance to the truth. So if you see that the hand is standing up, it is because the hand hasn't bowed down before anyone else. Those hands would rather be cut than to give themselves up in the hands of Bhakti. May our lives be sacrificed for those hands. May our lives be sacrificed for those hands. The hands of elders and the hands of small ones. You know, these hands that have been cut in Karbala. In saving the truth, you know. <laughs> With what emotion and through what kind of fitna were they cut? Mm. <laughs> Hussain refused to give bayat an allegiance to Yazid. He refused to give his hand in the hands of Yazid. Now you see that the Imam is leaving Medina. The Imam is leaving Medina, but you see, him leaving Medina again was not a trial for Hussein, was a trial for the people of Medina. It was a trial for the people of Medina. Oh Ansar, you helped the Prophet come to Medina, why aren't you helping his grandson? Oh Muhajireen, you immigrated with the Prophet from Mecca. Why aren't you immigrating with his grandson? Why aren't you going with him? Why aren't you migrating that he is leaving Medina? What's the use of Medina now? This is a test on them. Not on Hussein. But Hussein wanted to make this clear. He did not leave Medina in hiding, in silence. No. When he knew that he is leaving Medina, he went first to the grave of the Prophet. <coughs> you know, he went to the grave of the Prophet. And he went there and he said that, Grandfather, this was a town that has welcomed you. This was a city that gave you a home. And you regarded this your home. But today I am being forced to leave here. 
I have the same grandson that you used to show to the people with so much love. I have the same grandson that you used to kiss my neck in front of others. I have the same grandson that you used to hold high on your neck with pride so that you can show to the people. And you showed my position to the people and my rank to the people. But you see today that same grandson of yours is being forced to leave Medina. He's being forced to leave Medina. <coughs> that after he went to the grave of the Prophet, now he went to the grave of his brother. And said, Assalamu alaikum. My brother, I am leaving you. And it was only recently that you left me, but now I am leaving you. And Allah is going to take me to my destined place. He met his brother and then he went to the grave of his mother. He cried on her grave and then he went back and told everyone. Everyone now wanted to get ready and he gave orders. And you see that he gave orders to all his family. That everyone get ready, we are leaving. He said everyone is leaving. Even my children. My children are also leaving. Everyone. And then when everyone was now getting ready, one order that came from him startled everyone. One order that came from him startled everyone. He said, everyone is going with me except for my daughter, Fatima Sobara. She's going to stay in Medina. She's going to stay in Medina. When Fatima heard this, she came and said, Father, she was... She didn't know how to say this to her father. She was looking at everyone getting ready and packing up. And she saw that she's not packing and her heart fell down. And she was pleading with everyone. Pleading with everyone to go to her father to ask him, please let me go also. Why am I being stopped? Well, all my brothers and sisters are going. All my cousins are going. Everyone is leaving. I will be all alone here without them. Without all my brothers and sisters, especially Ali Azhar. <laughs> she wanted to see the case and now she went to her aunt. She knew that the only one who can talk to her brother eye to eye was Zainab. So she went to Zainab and she, she told him that, Aunt, please, you are the only one who can speak to my father. Please go and plead my case. Plead my case to him. I want to go. I don't want to be left here alone. Zainab, she came to Imam Hussein and said, Brother, you are the Imam and I do not doubt your judgment. All my life, my life has been in obedience to Allah and to, the, to you, the Imam of the time. Yes. But I want to just plead for this young girl, for your girl, who feels lonely and she is going to be lonely here without anyone. Why aren't you letting her come? I want to understand your reason. When Hussein heard this, tears started flowing from his eyes. No, no. <laughs> Tears started flowing from his eyes and he said, Zainab, do you know? Do you know that we are going to go and face a very great fitna in a trial? And that fitna will be such that all, all of us men are going to be killed. And all of the honored ladies and the granddaughters of the Prophet will be brought out in front of the people. <laughs> you know that all my children are replicas of my elders. All of them resemble my elders. My son Ali Akbar looks exactly like my grandfather. Is the replica of my grandfather. My daughter Fatima Kubra is a replica of my of my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. My daughter Fatima Sugra is the replica of Fatima Zahra, my mother. 
Zainab, tell me, how can I see the picture of my mother in the bazaar of Kufa and Shah? My mother is the one for whom I get that he was revealed. Allah has in her splendor and beauty from Allah. If she comes out in the world, then the angels will not leave this. The earth will shake. Nobody comes in. Who could have asked for a better ruler than the Prophet of Allah? Who could have asked for a better law than the law of Allah? Who could have asked for a better book than the book of Allah? And who could have asked for the blessings and the uh, favors that came through the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet. I mean, you couldn't have asked for anything better in this world. Then the question now is how is it that the situation became so bad in 61 years that <laughs> The same people that these blessings were given to. See, it's not outsiders. It's not people who don't believe. It's the same people who were given all these blessings, all these favors, right? What happened? That the situation and the environment became so bad that the uh, grandchildren of the Prophet, the same bloodline of the Prophet, mm. the bloodline that Allah has declared in the Quran as being free of impurity. Mm. A bloodline that is free of impurity, people who are free from impurity, people who have been purified by Allah. Why is it that their blood was shed and how did this nation reach that stage on one hand? And then with the same regard, with every revival, obviously the people thought that they are going to put out the flame of Allah. But Allah has different plans. They annihilated, they thought that they annihilated the bloodline of the Prophet, but Allah had a different plan that He again revived. It only took 61 years before the Muslim Ummah who received these blessings and these favors from Allah by medium of His Messenger. It only took them 61 years for them to annihilate His family and to kill His grandson. How does a favor like that and a bounty like that and this height that Allah had given to the people and to the Muslims in particular. He gave them his deen. He, he gave them his miraculous book. 
He gave them a just law. Ya Allah. And he gave them a merciful ruler. Ya Allah. The same spirit of Islam through the death of the Prophet's grandson. Mm. Revive that. And every you see so often, Allah revives it. And Allah gives the example and starts something that you see that again. The hearts of believers change and they return to Allah. They return to Allah. But every time you see that a new movement starts, that a new beginning occurs, that a new revival takes place, and a new uh, light is seen, you see again that there are some things that occur that again starts to break down those very things that uh, this new beginning has given the new faith, the energy, the light, the knowledge. Whenever it's revived, you see that something have some things happen, and people again get back. And وَلَقَدْ قَتَلْنَا الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ سَلَوَاتَ الْحَمْدُ وَالْحَمْدُ اللَّهُمَّ صَيَّا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلِي مُحَمَّدْ 1,431 years passed since the Prophet migrated to Medina and began the opening or went to the opening the victory that Allah gave him and established a Islamic state in Medina. Mm -hmm. 